And Scarlett, I've made you a co-host as well of this uh, workshop. So once uh, we do the intro, I'll stop sharing and you should be able to share. Okay, great, thank you. Okay. My plan is to give it a few more minutes until we have more participants. And we're, we're a couple of minutes before one anyway. <laughs> And then I will do the introductions. Okay. So maybe everybody's, hopefully everybody's in Shannon's group. <laughs> Were there two workshops going on right now? Yes. Yeah, I think it's still a little early. When you tell people one o'clock, they tend to first log on at one o'clock. So I'll give it a little time. Not too much time, not like this morning. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> She has 25. Well, it's just one o'clock now, so I, I thought I would give it maybe two or three more minutes. Oh, I do see the numbers starting to pop up. <laughs> Participants, so we'll give it another couple of minutes and then I'll get started. She's at 31. She's got a double, double mine. I said, you're gonna take over my job. I can see it now. It's already happening. <laughs> I said, that's okay, <laughs> you can have it. No, I'm just kidding. So it's 102 and we do have almost 20 participants in our session today. So even if people start to join us in the next minute or so, that's fine. I think I'll get started. That's okay with everybody. So I would like to, first of all, thank all of our participants for joining us for this session on tools for schools. My name is Robin Rosenberg and I am part of the organizing team for this conference, which has been made possible by the Garnett Health Medical Center 
and by the New York State Parenting Education Partnership that supports parenting educators, parents, and caregivers in creating nurturing environments for children to grow up in. Before we begin, I would like to take a minute to quickly familiarize you with the features here on Zoom. While you are not speaking during this meeting, we would ask you to please mute yourself to ensure optimal sound quality for all. You are welcome to leave your video on if you like. The video button and the mute button, of course, are generally on the bottom of your screen if you are using a laptop or a PC and they are an icon of a mic and a camera if you don't know that yet. Um, if you have questions during the presentation, please put those in the chat and we will be sure to respond there or during the interactive parts of the workshop. You can also show your appreciation or support by using the emoji feature, which should also be at the bottom of your screen. Lastly, depending on the device that you are joining us from, you can choose your view so that you can see multiple people on your screen or just the speaker. You can do that by selecting the gallery view and choosing speaker view or full gallery view. And please be aware that this session will be recorded. So if you prefer not to appear in the recording, you can certainly turn your camera off. And without further ado, I would like to turn this over to our wonderful keynote speaker, Scarlett Lewis. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Robin. Thank you all for joining us. I have a, another PowerPoint prepared for you all. Um, and we're gonna delve a little bit more into choosing love in this workshop and uh, maybe have a little bit of fun as well. Um, okay, we've got our Choose Love Movement ambassador on. Um, so this is so funny. Um, these must be slides that are, I'm sorry. <laughs> they must be slides that, yeah, okay. All right, here we go. Anyway, that I had deleted before. But anyway, thank you for joining me. And can you all see my screen? Stacy? can you say if you can see yes, it? Yes, you can say. You can see it. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. Um, so I just want to remind you about the formula for choosing love. Um, the formula for choosing love is actually a direct path to flourishing. And when we think about what we want for ourselves and our children in this life, and COVID has given us an opportunity to, and I say opportunity um, consciously, because I think, and I've heard this from a lot of people, um, it's made us pause and think about, reflect, and even make changes in our lives. And uh, one thing that hasn't changed, however, is, is, is what we want. And most people want to lead meaningful and purpose-filled lives and flourish. They want this for their children. They want this for themselves. And choosing love, the Choose the Love formula, the Choose Love movement is a direct path to doing that. So we start with courage if we're talking about the formula which is the courage to be present where you are and otherwise you're resisting or avoiding but facing your fear and discomfort which strengthens you to be able to practice gratitude to be grateful for what you have where you are in any situation by the way and understand that there are opportunities for growth and then um, that actually strengthens you to be able to find meaning in the difficulty in your lives through forgiveness. Forgiveness is a choice and it gives you personal freedom. Um, it, if you all were with me in the beginning, um, in my keynote, I talked about our book club. Uh, well, this month we are reading the book called The Choice. Um, it's by Dr. Edie Iger. I don't know if you have heard about it or, or read it, um, but she is a Holocaust survivor. And 
she, this book is, um, I'm, I'm actually a little relieved that it came out after I started the Choose Love movement because if it hadn't, you would have thought that I copied everything from her book. It is incredible. Um, and whenever I see um, forgiveness and choice and freedom, I think about Dr. Edie Eiger. Um, she went to the, uh, you know, she, like many other um, Jews in World War II, she went to the camp, the concentration camp in a cattle car um, and, and other ethnic cultures, by the way. Um, a three day ride with her family, her mom, her sister um, and her father. When they got to the camp, um, they, as everybody else, approached the angel of death. And um, he, her, the mom was in the middle of her two girls on either side. And they approached him like this, linking arms. And the angel of death, um, that's who he was known, Mendelin, I believe his name was. Um, he was the one that pointed left or right. And uh, one way went to the gas chamber. The other way was to the barracks. And he asked Edie directly, I think she was 12 or 14 years old, who is that there in the middle? And uh, if she had said, it's my sister, she would have been allowed to live. But she answered truthfully and she said, it's my mother. And so Magdalene said, well, she goes over here, you two girls go this way and you'll see her in a little while you'll be reunited. Well, they were never reunited. The mother was sent to her death in a gas chamber. And I, <laughs> what, my, my other ambassador started one of hers with games. This is how I start mine. Uh, but anyway, um, I'm, I'm saying this for a reason because um, one of the things that I really took away from that book and, and actually we're interviewing Dr. Iger is going to be joining us for our book club this month um, with Choose Love at the end of the month. Um, we're reading the, Choose, the, the Choice book and she's gonna be joining us. But one of the things um, that I took away from that book was that she was talking about how she still struggles with forgiveness for that, for that act, for saying it's my mother. Um, and by the way, uh, she answered truthfully. She didn't know, and she didn't know what the consequences were. And uh, this is so vitally important for a lot of our kids as well. Um, I learned so much from kids and 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 the the uh, young people that I talk to. And uh, you know, they've the the foster care in um, particular. Um, told me that it's really important to, for, they have to forgive themselves, even if it's for things that aren't, isn't really their fault, they still have to go through the process of forgiveness. So that's why it's freedom. Otherwise, if you don't forgive, you're not free. And Dr. Iger talks about us having a prison in our own mind, and we are the prisoner. Um, but what we don't realize is that we also have, we're also the jailer and we have the key. And it's in our pocket and it's called forgiveness. It's so important. Um, and it, it, it might be the only path to freedom that you have. Um, the only way to take your personal power back. It was for me. And then that propels us into being able to step outside of our pain and suffering that we all have. And um, to find purpose in our lives through empathy and service through compassion in action. Wow, so vitally important. That actually leads us to taking personal responsibility for our lives, where for we where are we are now, right now and where, we're, and going where we're going in the future. And that leads, and that us, leads to us to flourishing, flourishing. and of course, of course we're having a lot of fun. Lot of fun. So, so I wanted to do so just that little that recap, little recap and, and also remind you that we're modeling, we're modeling in the moment what choose love. Uh, looks like for for us and and in the moment we're modeling it for our kids um, and anxiety actually spreads faster than COVID does and um, even if the the words that come out of our mouth are correct <laughs> and appropriate um, this is only 40 percent of our communication the other part of our communication is through gesticulation through our eyes, through our 
our facial expressions, through our energy. It all has to be in sync. That is the message that we're sending out. And, and I want to share just a little uh, story. Um, I learned that modeling was so important um, through the tragedy uh, at Sandy Hook when I lost my six-year-old son there. Uh, and um, I always practice being present with my family. And, and by the way, a lot everything that I'm talking about are also things that we teach and we focus on in the Choose Love movement and the programming, the free programming um, that we're talking about. But being present in the moment is really, really important. Another famous Holocaust survivor, um, Viktor Frankl, um, has this wonderful quote. And he says, between stimulus, and stimulus is what happens to us in life, and our response, that's uh, our thoughtful response, not impetuous reaction, there's a space. And in that space lies our freedom and power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and freedom. So the way that we say it is that we have to choose how we thoughtfully respond. And we always, we can. Uh, and so um, anyway, you have to be present. You have to practice being present in the moment where life is to be able to choose your response, to be in this space, to be able to choose your response and take your personal power back. Um, this is a lot of what we focus on in the Choose Love movement. And uh, I practiced that before the tragedy. Um, I was a single mom and uh, my boys went to daycare, one that opened early because I had to go to work early and I had a long commute. And then, and then they were bused to another daycare because it closed later because I got home late. And so I never thought I had enough time with them. So the time that I had, I really wanted to be present. Um, and I was very meticulous about it. Um, we didn't have a TV because I didn't want to compete with the TV and lose. <laughs> so we read books, we played games, and, um, and I practiced being present with them every moment that I could. Uh, you can't do it 100% of the time, but, but I was very, very aware of it. And so that morning um, started like any other morning. I thoroughly enjoyed it because I was with my boys, and I walked um, Jesse out to meet his dad at the end of the driveway and he had written I, I turned around to give him a hug and he had written in the frost on the side of my car and you may have seen this picture in uh in my um keynote uh he he had written i love you and he had drawn hearts on all my windows and i knew that that was one of life's moments because i was present and i said you just wait right there even though i was running a little late even though his dad was right there i was like you just wait one minute i want to get a picture of this i ran inside got my phone came back out took a picture and uh gave him a big hug and sent him off and 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 uh I'm so grateful that I was present in that moment because I have a picture of my goodbye message that would be gone 15 minutes later because it was in the frost on the side of my car. Um, anyway, really important to be present. So you can be present during good times. So that's kind of easy, right? Your birthday, whatever else, more difficult to be present in, in, in the hard times. And uh, so when we were called to the school to... Um, pick up our children because everyone had been evacuated and I got there and of course I couldn't find my son I had to put him down on a list of missing people um, my older son who was 12 years old was in lockdown in Spanish class in seventh grade he texted me and he said can I come wait with you and I said sure because when they find Jesse because we were told oh they're just hiding it's going to take a long time for us to find them so we're combing resweeping the school we're looking in the woods and I thought, oh, absolutely. Jesse's led a small contingent of kids somewhere. They're hiding. It's going to take them a long time to find. So I was like, yes, JT, come and wait with me. And uh, so unbeknownst to me, I'm inviting my other child into like the most traumatizing um, event in our lives. And he was right there. Um, and so throughout the day, I had, um, you know, police officers, military men, <laughs> investigators coming up and asking me questions um, like, do you have a recent picture of Jesse? Did he have any identifying marks? Like, and I'm thinking, this is maybe not 
going to be good. And I look over and of course, JT is looking at me and I'm realizing I am teaching him in the moment right now how to handle not only possibly tragedy and loss, but also difficulty, roadblocks, challenges for the rest of his life. He's learning right now from me. His eyes were on me. It wasn't just what was coming out of my mouth. It was everything that I did. Um, and I realized that when you're aware of modeling, that you are modeling, especially in difficulty, it helps you rise to the challenge. It helps you be the best version of you. And I was able to do that for JT. It really helped strengthen me. And it's not that I didn't share authentically with him. Um, I did. I shared my feelings. I cried. Um, but I was able to rise to the occasion and be the best version of myself because I was present. And I realized that I could thoughtfully respond even in that situation. I had my power. Um, so uh, actually, I, I'd like... I just think these are so sweet and I just, I was going to take them out, but I just wanted to quickly go. I mean, kids are so incredibly creative um, when it comes to choosing love. I just love it so much. And we give lots of opportunities for the creativity for kids. And um, so uh, I wanted to just kind of go through these quickly. Um, we, we do a social emotional learning awareness month. It's February, the month of love. And uh, we always have a really special project that schools who are choosing love all across the country join in on and connect with. Um, the first year we did big murals and Senator Blumenthal brought them to Washington DC and they were hung in a formal installation there. Um, one year uh, they wrote essay, kids wrote essays on what choosing love meant to them and they were added into the congressional record and during a congressional hearing. So they're a permanent part of America's history. You know, just we try to do kind of fun things like this. One year we did poems and uh, we made a poem, a poetry book with all the poems that the kids wrote. And this is one in fifth grade. Kids, kids understand love and choosing love. Um, I choose love and I always will. It doesn't matter what the cost. Love is always my path. Love may be big. It may be small, no matter the size. It, it is always there. Love is at home with family. Love brings us together. So I always choose love because love is the strongest force, stronger than titanium and stronger than hate. Love will change people, make them great. Love is not a burden. Love is stronger than we know. Love is a force, invisible to the eye, yet it changes your life. It allows us to fly high. I choose love and I always will. Um, what a focus. What a focus to like come into school and to think about love and the, the empowering concept that it's a choice that we all have. Here's courage. That was fifth grade. This is uh, eighth grade. Courage is a crazy thing that everyone should have. Our lives are full of times that we must use courage to get through the day refuse the urge to be scared or fearful and just be happy, positive and happy. Go with the flow and express yourself. It's easy once you try it. See the light at the end of the tunnel. Love yourself and everything around you. Open up your heart and value life and it's everlasting love. Spelling courage, isn't that fun? Uh, and then here's a formula by a seventh grade boy. If you wanna make a good love entree, you need the right formula and the right ingredients. Since it takes the longest start with forgiveness, <laughs> see kids know this too. First boil the hate out in water for about 30 minutes. Hmm. Since it takes a while, you might, you might want to lightly salt it with patience. After that, put it in a strainer and watch as the hate water floods out. Take your forgiveness and just let it dry. Next, take your courage out of the freezer. It's actually a very important ingredient, but most people just let it sit in their freezer, never even bothering to try it out in different dishes. Sprinkle some certainty on a flat surface and roll out your courage, both sides in it. Now start with kneading out the fear. Once that's done, we'll roll it out with positive choices and cut it out in different shapes. My favorite is public speaking. When you're happy with the way it looks, put it in the oven and let it sit for 50 to 60 minutes at 365 degrees. As the courage cooks, it's time to prepare the gratitude. 
Gratitude is best when there's lots of different kinds. Chop it up in little pieces so it can feed many people. To add extra flavor, you can saute it in mindfulness. And that's where you have your gratitude. This could be used in almost every meal of the day. It's very healthy and I think you'll find it overall improves diet. <laughs> Isn't that great? I love these. Okay, so can we just uh, take a deep breath together for a moment? <sighs> Become present in the moment, it's where life is happening. Uh, it takes mindfulness to be present because most of us uh, are living in the past, thinking about things that happened before or planning or fearing for the future. And we miss out so much on what's going on right here and now. The present moment is where life's happening, that's it. So can I just ask that for the next hour, we are together. Uh, and present, grateful to be here, the, uh, the uh, get to versus the have to, and open to learning and personal growth, understanding that yes, this is for your kids, but even more so it's for yourself. So let's sit for a moment, close our eyes. If you feel comfortable, take a deep breath and be here now. You're safe and among community. Focus on your breath and let all the distractions and busyness float away. Don't resist, just allow thoughts to float out just like they came in. That's what thoughts do. They come in, that's what our mind's supposed to do. It's okay, we thank them and let them go. Let's focus, focus for a moment on gratitude. We're so grateful to be here with you. We're grateful for this time we have together. We are here for a reason and a purpose, and it will serve us. We set the intention together today to utilize the information we receive during this workshop to fortify our compassionate life, our families, our communities, and the world. We consciously choose to grow from this experience today. We walked in one person, but we will leave having not only benefited physically, mentally, and emotionally, but we enhance our emotional intelligence, our awareness, and our conscious abilities with the knowledge and wisdom we receive. Let's set the intention together to experience what we hear and what we feel today with curiosity and anticipation. Let's expect miracles. <laughs> Let's give up our cleverness and take on wonderment. Let's be open to allowing a different perspective. And in these life lessons, we set the intention to grow and expand personally with ourselves, our children, family, friends, and beyond. Let's allow the information shared today to personally empower us, that our gratitude grows for ourselves and others. Let's visualize our gratitude expanding so that each one of us walks away with a renewed energy, a revitalized sense of purpose, and a restored faith in humanity and in ourselves. Let's take one more deep breath in for a count of four. Hold for a count of four. And then release for a count of six. Okay, let's begin. Excuse so, me. yes. Sorry to interrupt. I just want to say the screen hasn't been sharing if that was your intention. Uh, oh. You've done a great job reading the slides, but we're seeing uh, your beautiful smile, but just not your screen. Great. Thank you very much. Yep. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> okay. So just to recap quickly, the Choose Love uh, movement is a social and emotional learning program. Uh, it includes 
positive psychology, mindfulness, post-traumatic growth, growth mindset, neuroscience, emotional intelligence, character education, and more. It is intended to be a one-stop shop where you can go and get everything that you need for free. It's easy to teach, easy to learn. Um, it was actually created by educators for educators. It's flexible, takes very little time, but here's the key. Uh, a lot of times people think of SEL as something that you, oh, okay, hold on, time for SEL. Okay, hold on, we're gonna take it off the shelf. We're gonna open this book uh, and we're gonna teach SEL for about 45 minutes. Okay, okay, on to the next subject. But in reality, um, what we're learning through COVID actually, um, when we think about the benefits of COVID, it has been the understanding that social and emotional learning is a priority and it actually impacts every aspect of our lives. And instead of looking at it as a program, we need to look at it as a way of life. <laughs> in fact, uh, it was interesting because the, the year that we released this program, I had a group of educators that literally got together and they came and they said, we need to talk to you about the title of the program. And I said, okay, sure. And they said, well, we want you to change it. Uh, and I said, all right, well, we've changed it. Actually, this is Choose Love Enrichment Program is our original one. It's now Choose Love for Schools because we've redone it during COVID. Um, but they wanted me to change the name to Choose Love Lifestyle. And I said, really? I said, why? And they said, because it's not a program. That's a misnomer. Um, at the very least, you have to call it a practice, but it's not a program. Um, it's something that you do all the time throughout your life, in every aspect of your life. So it becomes who you are and it's a lifestyle. And uh, I said, well, Mm, I've trademarked Choose Love Enrichment Program. That's a problem. <laughs> but anyway, you get the idea. Um, so we made it so that the educators, a lot of the educators that worked on it are actual teachers and they work in classrooms. So they know what you need. Um, we're here to love and support um, those who we consider our modern day superheroes. And that those are educators and anyone that works with children. We focus on the physical, mental, and emotional benefits. Um, we're aligned with the American School Counselor Association Mindsets and Behaviors because a lot of the people that are teaching this program are counselors. And then they're, they use the uh, educators for backup support. Um, it enhances the classroom and school climate. And it's a large factor in children's future success. And we made it a lot of fun. Um, and it's no cost. There's really nothing else like it on the market. So we call it next generation. Um, and we're gonna go through a little bit more about how the formula plays out through the program today, kind of from a 360 degree view. Um, I wanna just remind you, one of the main themes is that we can't always choose what happens to us, but we can always choose how we thoughtfully respond. That's when we take our personal power back. When we choose love, kindness, caring, concern, compassion, civility, we are able to take our personal power back. When we react with prolonged anger, hatred, revenge, we give our personal power away. So I want to remind you that Choose Love is a movement and it is for everyone. There's programming on our website for everyone. We have prenatal um, because it's very important. It's a very important time for brain development, and uh, a a um, the cortisol that's released during stress crosses the blood-brain barrier and negatively impacts a baby's forming brain. So, in other words, literally, uh, the prefrontal cortex comes out smaller than it would have because you're giving your baby signals saying, "Hey, you don't need to come out and think. You need to come out and run." And uh, this really resonated with me because I was stressed during both of my pregnancies. But if I knew that there was something that I could have done, uh, even if I couldn't have changed my situation, if I could have changed what I had control over, which was myself and my thoughtful response to what was happening, um, it would have been very empowering. So that was the first program that I ever did. Then we did uh, infant toddler. Um, if you bring your kids to daycare, which I did with both of my kids, um, loving, kind, wonderful, tremendous people there. But a lot of times they're not trained 
in early childhood development, and they don't understand brain development at that age. And that is a pivotal point for brain development. Um, so this is just training for the adults and it's free. Uh, I encourage educators, if you bring your kids to daycare, drop it off. If you pass a daycare on the way to school, drop it off. Those are the kids that are gonna come into your classroom. <laughs> and uh, I have daycare providers now calling me saying, Scarlet, oh my gosh, I feel really bad saying this, but we advertise ourselves as choose love daycares. And every woman that walks in here is sold because they love that concept. And I say, I'm happy. I'm so, I couldn't be happier. That makes me so happy that people appreciate that. Then we go into the school-based programming, pre-K through 12th grade. Now we have the original program, which is the Choose Love Enrichment Program. We have a new program that was created in COVID um, that's called Choose Love for Schools. That is also up online. Um, but we also have programming that we created specifically for the time that we're in right now, which is called Choosing Love in Our Brave New World. Um, during my, in my um, work with businesses, um, I created a benefit corporation and I have partners in that benefit corporation. One of the partners is a Harvard trained corporate trainer. She's a rock star. She has big corporations that ask her to solve major problems. And uh, the last problem that she worked on before she came into Choose High Performance was um, how to help reintegrate soldiers with PTSD back into their families after long absences. And so she created a model, wrote a white paper, I read it and I said, wow, that's kind of like where we are right now, a little bit, right? We've, we're, we're in an unprecedented time. We're all feeling stressed, um, novel experience, experiences. We're all grieving the loss of the world that we knew, the world that we expected, um, sometimes significant loss, um, sometimes just seeing one another. Uh, and so how can we translate that for kids? And so we created this program called Choosing Love in Our Brave New World, um, loosely based off of that program. It's really powerful and it was created for right now. Um, we're gonna get into that in a moment. Um, so, this is all everything that's in it. So we focus on what we can control rather than what we can't control. And here's how we use each of the character values. So courage creates the opening in our heart. Um, gratitude shifts our lens. Forgiveness frees us and compassion and action can change our world. We really focus on breathing and mindfulness in every single lesson because it's so vitally important. Um, each of the pillars ha has the same model, the same sequencing as you go through. Um, so we explain the core value. We explain the neuroscience behind the core value. We do a focused awareness practice, which is breathing and mindfulness, um, recognizing, so going over a, a presence, a present practice, a practice of being present, um, lessons, role models, and then exercises. So practice, because it's not just enough to know it here, you have to actually practice it. And the beautiful thing is that kids <laughs> take it home and uh, they talk with their parents about it. They actually they actually share it with their parents and, and they actually use it in really difficult situations. The feedback we've gotten is phenomenal. Um, in Hawaii, we've got Hawaii is one of our biggest states. And I don't know if you remember, but they had um, what I call the missile crisis. So um, they all have an app on their phone and um, they know that uh, because they're the closest to North Korea, that if North Korea were to launch a missile, it would hit Hawaii. They have the capability and they know that that would take 17 minutes. And so they would get a notification on their phone. They have this system set up. And they know that they have 17 minutes to put their plan in place, whatever that may be. Uh, and they all have an emergency plan or they're supposed to. So um, one Saturday, the uh, alert went off on their phone, on their app. Uh, it said, this is not a test. There is an incoming missile. Uh, and so you can imagine 
kids were home with their parents. They were pushing them down manholes. They were hiding them in bathtubs. We actually have an ambassador uh, in Hawaii. And she said that she and her husband, her kids are grown. Their plan was to go to the hospital and stay there. Uh, and she said, instead, we were in bed and we just decided we held each other and we just waited for the end. Uh, and then of course, 17 minutes came, 18 minutes, 19 minutes, and they turned on the TV and they started to realize that it had been a false alarm. But the interesting thing happened on Monday, we started getting all these calls to the schools. What are you teaching our kids? Because during this time, during this incredibly stressful time, they were trying to get us to do brave breaths. <laughs> and stand in a brave pose. They were teaching us how to manage our emotions. These are elementary school kids, by the way. And, uh, and so we started having all these requests to talk about the parent program because the kids were using it in difficult times. It was really incredible. So we created the program so it won't feel like a burden. Um, teachers have so much on their place. Hey, pre-COVID, <laughs> uh, you guys were overloaded and, and you, have, you have so many job descriptions, I can't even keep up. Um, so we know that and we wanted to, how do we support these superhero educators so that it doesn't seem like this is one more thing to do, but it actually supports, it makes their jobs easier. So um, we started with deepening the culture and the framework within you are, where you already teach creating a program that builds a sense of self within the kids so they're more autonomous, more independent. It strengthens a sense of community. Everyone rise, rises together and it produces the best mindset with which to learn. So let's go into the, uh, the formula um, and let's do a little bit deeper dive than we did this morning. So we know that courage is the willingness and ability to walk through obstacles despite feeling embarrassment, fear, reluctance, or uncertainty. And what does courage look like in the classroom? Because it's not just the kids, it's the educator as well. And courage is being present um, with your kids where they are. I know that's really difficult via screens, um, but it's possible to a certain extent and um, being vulnerable yourself, um, being present, modeling, but also being vulnerable. Um, you guys have heard this, uh, students won't remember the context of the lesson, but they remember how you made them feel. And vulnerability is the key to connection and connection is the most important part of human life. Um, you guys have heard of the man in the arena quote, this is regarding courage. Uh, it's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man or woman who is actually in the arena whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, metaphorically, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes up short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself or herself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. I thought this was such an appropriate quote for right now because that's how I see all of you educators. This is such an important time in the history of our world, a novel time. I don't know if you are familiar with the researcher, Dr. Brene Brown out of the University of Texas in Houston. She talks about how important courage is. In fact, she researches courage and connection. She says it doesn't matter whether you talk to people who work in social justice, mental health and abuse and neglect. What we know is that connection, the ability to feel connected is neurobiologically how we're wired. It's why we're here. Um, you look at all of the 
suffering that leads to violence um, such that Sandy Hook suffered, um, uh, uh, substance abuse, suicide, um, all of these diseases of despair, it can be boiled down to lack of connection. So we need to learn how to connect. We're not born. It's so amazing. We're born with mere neurons up here. So in other words, in other words, like it, it, they did experiments where they put this guy in a, in a, in a area, they put all these things on his brain to watch the activity of his brain. Right. And they said, smile. So on the screen, they saw all the areas of his brain that lit up while he smiled. And then they saw, they, they monitored the neurochemicals that washed over him based on smiling. Then they told him, don't smile. And they showed him a picture of a guy smiling, but they told him not to smile. What happened on the screen? Same areas in the brain lit up and then the same neurochemicals washed over him. Wow. So we've got these powerful neuro um, mirror neurons that help us connect because we're supposed to. Hey, listen, we have to connect for our survival and in order to th uh, thrive but we don't know how to connect. We, we're supposed to, but we don't know how we have to learn. That's what we're talking about, learning how to connect. So vitally important. Um, I know some big kids that need to learn these skills and tools too, do you? <laughs> anyway, a vulnerability. Um, in order for connection to happen, we have to allow ourselves to be seen, really seen. So in other words, to be vulnerable. And that doesn't mean just with one another. That actually means with our children to a certain extent, our students as well. So uh, Brene Brown, she's a renowned researcher and author from the University of Houston, studied thousands of people and their responses. What those people who were successful at making genuine connections had in common was a sense of courage. Isn't that interesting, really? So courage is necessary for connection. Uh, these folks had the courage to be imperfect. Three things. Two, the compassion to be kind to themselves first and then to others. Because as it turns out, we can't practice compassion with other people if we can't treat ourselves kindly first. And then third, they had connection as a result of authenticity. They were willing to let go of who they thought they should be in order to be who they were, which you absolutely have to do for authentic connection, which is what we all want. So what do we do instead? We numb vulnerability. And there's evidence, and it's not the only reason this evidence exists, but it's a huge cause. We're the most in debt, obese, addicted, and medicated adult cohort in US history. The problem is, and Brene Brown learned this from research, that you can't selectively numb emotion. You can't say, here's the bad stuff, here's vulnerability, here's grief, here's shame, here's fear, here's disappointment. I don't wanna feel these. I'm gonna have a couple of beers and a banana nut muffin. You can't numb those hard feelings without numbing the other effects, our emotions. You can't selectively numb. So when we numb those, we numb joy, we numb gratitude, we numb happiness, and then we're miserable and we're looking for purpose and meaning and then we feel vulnerable so then we have a couple of beers and a banana mu nut muffin and it becomes this dangerous cycle isn't it interesting do you resonate with this i resonate with this so one of the really important things that we start out with and that is literally at least little kids absolute favorite thing is the brave breath the brave breath um, is something that kids do for years. <laughs> I mean, we've been out there for five years now, and I have kids that started five years ago. They haven't been taught for the other four, and they're still doing their brave breath. Um, people love it, and it's a hand on the heart, hand on the belly. It's learning to breathe through your belly, not breathe like this, because this increases anxiety when we breathe like that, these are 
shallow breaths, but when we breathe through our belly, like it's a balloon and we feel the belly expanding, that's, that is calming our nervous system. And you can feel that almost immediately. And the brave breath is simply taking three brave breaths, breathing in, holding it for four, and then breathing out. And it's a way, it's a way to pause, to get into that space between stimulus and response. It's a way to be able to take your personal power back, to thoughtfully respond, to take your control back in any situation. So a courageous learner is a curious learner. Here are the six attributes of courage. Feeling fear, yet choosing to act. Following your heart persevering in the face of adversity, standing up for what is right, expanding your horizons, letting go of the familiar, facing suffering with dignity, faith, and hope. So really what we're talking about is victimization versus taking personal responsibility for where you are and where you're going. Um, it's a really tough lesson, um, but you can be walked through it and get to the point where, where that's what you want to do. Um, we talked about modeling. I shared my modeling story earlier. I want to share a story now about courage. Um, so uh, I, tr I travel from, from school district to school district. And before COVID, before March, uh, I was constantly on the road. And so um, I fly a lot. And, uh, and, I, and I'm not crazy about flying, honestly. So there you have it. And so when I do, I always want a window seat so I can get my bearings and see the ground as soon as possible. Um, so I'm on this plane, we boarded and we're taking off in the afternoon and I'm going overnight over the largest body of water. And um, it's, it's a very long flight, leaving at four in the afternoon and then arriving in the morning. So going from one school district to another. So anyway, I'm on the plane and I'm, I'm, you know, everybody's getting settled in, flight attendants are going back and forth. And I look out and I see outside my window, I'm sitting over a wing. I see this tube over the wing, whatever it is, electrical wire, I don't know. And I know it's not right. <laughs> I know that that's not what it's supposed to look like. That's a flap right there. Um, but I'm like, somebody else is going to say something. You know, the, the uh, flight attendants are, you know, the pilots are still doing their checks. And we've got, this is a huge plane. There's so many people sitting on the, the window seat. Somebody else is going to see this. I don't have to say anything. Well, no one did. So they start backing up and then they are heading down the runway. And the flight attendants do their final check. And I'm always in the back of the plane. I don't know why. I always want to be in the front. And so they're sitting right behind me. They strap themselves in and we're second for takeoff. And I'm looking out and I'm like, if you see it out here on the wing, I'm like, I cannot, I cannot, I cannot believe nobody's saying anything. This is incredible. I, I, I don't want to say anything, but I can't not. Finally, I'm like, excuse me, excuse me. I'm so sorry. There, there's something on the wing. And of course, you know what you're going to get. They were so annoyed. Oh, what? Unbuckle. What is, what is it? And I'm like, there's something on the wing that's not supposed to be there. And the flight attendant looks at me and she goes, you're right. That isn't supposed to be there. I'm going to call the pilot. She calls the pilot, plane stops, disgruntled pilot comes back, looks out the window, shakes his head, turns around. The whole plane turns around. And so he says, so sorry, folks, somebody saw something on the wing. It's probably nothing, but your safety is our biggest concern. We have to turn around. Those of you that have connections will probably miss them. And I'm going, oh my God, what have I done? I can't believe this. So we pull back in the place and here are these guys, they pull this part off, right? They have no idea what it is. And, uh, and about 20 minutes later, the pilot and that flight attendant walk down the aisle way. And they say, um, who's the person that raised their hand and stopped the plane? <laughs> like, oh, oh. And so I, I'm like this, me, me. Well, they walk up to me and the flight attendant says, thanks so much for saying something. It's my birthday. And I wanted to live to see another birthday. Uh, and the reason that I say that is because then something interesting happened. People in front of me stood up 
people behind me stood up and they turned to me and they literally said, thank goodness you had the courage to say something. We did not have the courage to say something. So I have to be honest, the first thing that I thought of, the first thought was like, yes, <laughs> validation. We start with courage. That's our first character value that we go into. Uh, and, and we, you know, if you're doing this throughout the year, which we want you to do, you spend a whole quarter on courage, the first quarter for a reason. And I'm like, yes, right. Yeah, this, yeah, validation. Um, we need to focus on courage. And then I thought, my gosh, you mean people did see that and they thought that that they may not live through it and they, they didn't have the courage to say anything? And then third, I thought, oh my gosh. Well, I travel around the world talking about courage. I share Jesse's story of courage and, and how, how my 12 year old son was so courageous. And, and, and I'm, I, and I try to model courage and, and I almost didn't have the courage to say anything. So I like sharing that story because it just talks about how important courage is and how we need to keep it in the forefront of our mind and practice it every day. <laughs> it's really important. Um, fear has an acronym, by the way. I don't know if you've heard this. There are two acronyms. I'm not going to say one of them. Uh, a teacher came and whispered one to me after um, one of my web webinars, but there is another one and it's called uh, false evidence appearing real. Do you realize that between 85 and 97% of what happens to us, of what we fear in life, of our fears never happens? But here's the problem. We fear, we have these scenarios that run through our mind as part of our negative bias. Thank you very much, mind, for that. But I've got it. Uh, those are the affirmations that you can say, right? Because that's what our mind's job is, to keep us safe. But here's the problem. So many of those fears that run through our head every day never happen. But our bodies prepare for those things to happen because they don't know in our mind that it's not actually happening right now. That's where the difficulty comes for your actual health, physical and mental. So I love this quote, 500 years ago, Michael de Montaigne, one of the most significant philosophers of the French Renaissance said, my life has been filled with terrible misfortune, most of which never happened. So I just want you to be aware of some of these things. Sometimes awareness is so vitally important. Um, we also have to have the courage to be generous in our assumptions of one another. Um, have you ever had a scenario? I have, okay, during one of my presentations, um, you know, in person, it's a lot easier to kind of like do other things and not be so obvious about it when you're listening to a speaker, but when you're in a room in front of the speaker and the speaker can see all of you, it's a little bit harder not to be you know, like to, you, you kind of have to like be there <laughs> if you want to be um, uh, courteous. And uh, I saw this guy on his phone, right? And he's like, just the whole time. And then he just got up and he walked out. And I was like, like during the middle of it. And I was like, I was offended. And I don't know, maybe I was in a bad state of mind that morning or something. I don't know, but it just offended me. I was like, wow, like, he just, um, really? Like, I'm, I'm talking about my son and I don't know, like, like my heart and my life and, and you're just, I'm usually not like that, but this one day I was. And so I was like, wow, I want to get his feedback. <laughs> so I found him afterwards and I walked up to him and I said, Hey, um, you know, I saw that you were on your phone the whole time and then you like just left. Um, did you not like what I had to say? And he was, he was like, oh my gosh, my daughter is in the hospital. He said, I, I was actually supposed to be at the hospital today and I wanted to come and hear you speak. So I, 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 but I said I would be available and they're like texting me from the hospital. And so I'm so sorry. I had to go outside, but I came back in. Maybe you didn't see that. It was like, I was like, oh my God, this is, this is, this is a great example 
of remembering to be generous in your assumptions of one another, especially now during COVID, we're all going through so much <laughs> and, uh, and, and we need to give each other the benefit of the doubt really important. And here are, we went through, um, the, the, I'm, sh I'm assuming that everybody was with me in my keynote. So we went through um, all of this, all of these um, benefits of courage, the scientific benefits of courage, um, really important. So let's continue. Um, I talked about the MAID study, but I didn't describe it. So um, in Harvard University, um, Ellen Langer in 2007 did a study called the Hotel MAID study. And um, she invited a whole bunch of hotel maids, hotel maids um, into a experiment center. And she gave them a thorough physical along with a blood test. And then she split them into two groups. She made one group mindfully aware of the benefits of being a hotel maid. She said, you know, by, um, by scientific standards, you exceed the Surgeon General's uh, description of being active and and in doing so there are tons of benefits that you ex you should experience like better heart health you lose weight you lower your blood pressure you have better moods I mean she went through this list um, of just telling the maids what they um, could be experiencing based on their level of activity to the control group, she told nothing. She sent them all out to their jobs afterwards for two weeks. And then two weeks later, she invited them back into the research center, gave them the same physical and lo and behold, the maids that had been made mindfully aware of the benefits of doing what they were already doing, experienced those benefits on an exponential level. In other words, two weeks later, they had lost weight. They reported better moods. They had better heart health. They had lower blood pressure. All of these things, it was incredible just because they became aware of the benefits of what they had already been doing. So in other words, we use that research in our programming to make sure that you and the students are aware of the benefits of, of what you're practicing. So we have gratitude, mindful thankfulness, and the ability to be thankful even when things in life are challenging. We went through all of the um, the scientific benefits of being grateful. My three favorites being better sleep, longer life, and stronger immune system. <laughs> um, but when you, when you think about what is gratitude, there's an attitude of gratitude, which is a way to be resilient, optimistic, and hopeful in the face of adversity. Does that sound like something that's important with COVID? It's a mindset like a muscle that grows with use. You actually get stronger when you use it um, and we use, sometimes we use positive affirmations. Remember I talked about our thoughts and how the majority of our thoughts every day are negative and repetitive. Well, when you're a kid, you say, oh, I hate myself. Nobody likes me. Uh, I'm so stupid, right? You've heard kids with that outward expression. Some of them don't. But what happens to that outward expression of negativity when we grow up? Does it just go away? You don't see a lot of adults saying that, but sometimes they do. <laughs> no, a lot of times that outward expression of negativity goes inward. That's how we talk to ourselves. It's that little voice, that troll sitting on our shoulder that talks negatively to ourselves. Um, why does it do that? Is, that? is that voice there to torture us? No, it's part of our negative bias. It's actually there to keep us safe. We have just let it run rampant over us. And so we need to actually get control over it. And we can do this through positive affirmations, through turning those negative statements into positive statements so that we can actually turn that negative voice into our greatest cheerleader. That's what it's supposed to be. So uh, creating that mindset, that supportive and loving mindset first for yourself, right? Every grateful thought impacts us on a cellular level and fire neurons, fires neurons in our brains that wire us for gratefulness. So this amazing thing that every single thought that we have impacts us on a cellular level. Every single cell in our body is impacted by every thought that we have. Wow. And every thought that we have is wiring our brain. So if we have the continuous negative 
thoughts, it's creating a super highway. But if we shift our thoughts and choose gratitude, we're firing new neurons. We're making new neural pathways and we're changing up the map of our brain. Really, really important. Um, takes practice, but it's worth it. Um, we have perspective taking with gratitude, the ability to find and see the good in any situation, kind of like the glass half full rather than the glass half empty. Gratitude can take a variety of forms, people, things, qualities, traits, etc. Part of being grateful is recognizing the good in yourself, of course. There's so much, many scientific benefits of gratitude. Um, we've been over these, which is really nice. Um, so we're actually not going to do these because um, we're running a little late. Um, but I, I did want to have you write down three reasons you became a teacher, three things that you're grateful for in your current teaching job, and three reasons why you're grateful to be in this workshop today. Um, that helps you shift, mind shift um, from I have to, to I get to. Remember, your have to is always somebody else's get to. And how do you get your students ready to be present and learn? You have them. Um, a lot of times, um, if you do the Choose Love movement, you have journals, Choose Love journals that kids write in. Ask them, write down five things that you're grateful for, for taking math, reading and writing, social studies. Get them in that framework. It's, it's like a mind bender. It's like, ooh, even when we sat down, we had a hard time. We had to write down these, these gratitudes. And we, we, had, we were like, ah, oh, this is a stretch. This is hurting my head. <laughs> but it's because it's creating those new neural pathways, right? Um, we have little videos online. We're not going to go into these videos, but going through how to do all of these breaths, um, tutorials. You can actually listen to videos of the original curriculum writers. We have more now because we've upgraded the curriculum since then. We have for the younger kids, we have little um, videos that we did um, produced specifically for these character values. Um, really fun. And how do you practice gratitude in education? Remind yourself of why you became a teacher, um, the get to versus the have to. Um, you know, it's interesting. People in Sandy Hook still come up to me in the grocery store and they'll go, oh, Scarlett, oh my God, oh my day. I have to take three boys to three different sporting events, uh, uh, soccer and, and, and uh, football and track. And then I have to go home and I have to do this huge pile of laundry from multiple stinky, dirty boys. Uh, well, you know how I hear that, wow you get to take three boys to three different sporting events and then you get to go home and you get to do a huge load of laundry from three boys. Wow, your get to, your have to is my get to. <laughs> uh, just driving that point home. Um, so much to be grateful about being a teacher because you all are our superheroes. So how do we, how do we create an attitude of gratitude? Set your intention, do something outside your comfort zone, Reframe a problem into an opportunity. Avoid energy drainers. Carry yourself like an optimist. And lighten up. Lighten up. That's why I couldn't believe what one of these ambassadors started this program last night with games. And I was like, oh my God, I may be uncomfortable. I was like, she's starting with games. These people want, they need SEL. They need to know like what's going on. They need stories. They need, and it was awesome. It was awesome. It was so light and so fun. And then she got into all the other stuff. <laughs> I wrote her and I said, that was great. I really learned a thing or two from you <laughs> to lighten up, in other words. Um, so we have overarching goals. This is all written out in our curriculum. Uh, and one of my previous board of directors, Dr. Thomas Przinsky from Quinnipiac University, he is a positive psychology professor. And uh, this is his quote, the key to happiness is recognizing micro moments of joy. Um, this is really your, if, if I could give you some homework tonight, um, I would like for you the next week to practice being present and then to recognize the micro moments of joy that happen every single day in your life. Um, they happen, but we're usually too distracted. Um, we have anxiety. 
uh, and fear and, and we're not in the present moment. So we don't see them, but actually micro moments of joy are happening every single day. And so your homework would be to be present and recognize those micro moments of joy and when they happen. And they're not big things that are gonna hit you over the head. They're little things like having a nice warm cup of tea. And savor them because this is what strengthens you to be able to manage your emotions during difficulty. Um, here's some great things to do. Wave at cars that go by. Um, my family owns a Ford dealership in, uh, in, uh, I'm not associated with it, but in Fayetteville, Arkansas. And Arkansas is another big state for Choose Love. And this is the car that they give me when I visit. <laughs> so wave at cars that go by. Um, and you know, it's easy to get annoyed. Um, how do you move past annoyance? Do you ever get annoyed at people? Like I, I get annoyed at people, I have to admit. And uh, finding the good or being grateful for others, being generous in your assumptions, that's a way to, uh, to get past that. Otherwise, you're just dealing in conspiracies like I was, um, looking at the guy on his phone and being annoyed and, and, and like literally kind of like facing off with him and then realizing I was completely wrong. I was completely wrong. Um, we talked about the get to versus the have to, really important for gratitude. Um, we've got goals for gratitude too. Let's go to forgiveness. Um, you know, people say to me, you make it look so easy. Um, and, and the other thing they say is, how could you forgive the man who murdered your son? And, you know, the interesting thing is with all that I know about forgiveness and having practiced it now for eight years, almost eight years, um, my response, at least in my head is, how can I not, how can I not forgiveness is the only way that I could take my personal power back. Would I give my personal power to a very troubled young murderer? Would I allow him? to have control over my thoughts that impact my feelings, that then impact my behavior and my relationships? No, but the only way for me to take my personal power back is through forgiveness. It's probably the most important lesson I've learned in my entire life. I was giving a talk on a military base and this young woman um, listened to me talking about forgiveness and she just broke down and sobbed. And uh, she shared a little bit about what happened. We were in a small group. And uh, she said that um, suffice it to say that the person who hurt her had gone to jail for a long time, but then she saw him and he had gotten out. And uh, she said, I, I wanted to forgive him. So I, 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 I walked up to him and it was, I had every intention of forgiving him. And she said, I couldn't, I dropped everything that I had and I ran out of the store and she was sobbing. And she said, I, I couldn't do it. What do you have to say to that? What do you have to say to that? And the only thing that I could say is that, is it worth it? Is it worth holding on to that pain and anger like you are? Or do you want to let it go? And the only way that you let it go is through forgiveness. Here's a discussion question. I wish we had time to do a discussion, <laughs> but you can think about it. And if you can figure out an answer, you can email me. Why is it so difficult for adults to forgive? And it becomes the favorite character value for kids. I still can't believe I'm saying this. Uh, I, I'm outside of school in Hawaii and they're fifth grade boys and they're all running around me. It's their last day of school. They've been choosing love all year. And I'm passing out these bracelets with choose love formula on it. And they're, they're really excited. They're yelling and, you know, pushing each other for fun. And I'm like, Hey, Hey guys, Hey guys, what was your favorite character value? And they're like, forgiveness. Yeah. And I'm like, what? <laughs> really? Like, I would think that they would say courage or compassion in action. Uh, forgiveness? Why? And they said, because it feels so good to let it go. It's a superpower. I was like, wow, 
Wow, incredible, right? Um, why is it so hard for us? Uh, Cause you know why? Cause we don't really understand it and we don't really know how to do it. Uh, at least I didn't. Um, and then I went through the true meaning of compassion, the identifying the empathetic component, which is painful and can result in empathy burnout and empathy fatigue. And then the action component where all of the nurturing, healing, love that we give out comes back to us. In, in, and I like to say all the nurturing love we give out is the healing love we get back. And there's science to back that up. It's important to understand the difference between empathy, sympathy, and compassion in order to make connection and to use compassion and action to help facilitate connection, which is what we're all about, right? Empathy is putting yourself in somebody else's shoes. It's vulnerability. It's per perspective taking, staying out of judgment, recognizing emotion in other people and communicating. It's the vulnerable choice, empathy. Sympathy is feeling sorry or pity for someone and sympathy actually drives disconnection. Interesting, right? Compassion is empathy and action, which drives connection with one another. So we also have a whole neuroscience that was written for us proprietarily. Um, there's three parts of the brain and we have labels for them. The human brain, the numbat brain, which is our mammalian brain, our emotional center, and the lizard brain, which is the reptilian brain. We have little pictures for each of them. And uh, I have to tell you that um, I remember when Dr. Chris Cook, who wrote these for us, actually taught the team at Choose Love. Um, we, it changed our life. It changed our life to understand just these three parts of our brain, what they're responsible for, and the fact that we have the ability to nudge our numb back to hug our human. Um, so in other words, when we're feeling difficult emotions, um, we can literally hug our human brain, which is where logic and reasoning reside. And I don't know about you, but I want to be making choices from my prefrontal cortex <laughs> where logic and reasoning reside. So, so it's really important to create a culture of choosing love. Um, and so we have a constitution that you um, create with your students and you can change it as you go through each of the different character values. It's really important to hang up the words in the classroom and in your whole school. In fact, one of the first schools that piloted the program, it was a middle school in Stanford and the art instructor created a six foot by six foot paper mache heart. And she put the formula on it and she put it right in the middle of the front door. So in other words, like, you literally, it was kind of like awkward. You had to walk around it like that. And I said, did you mean to have the heart right there? And she said, yeah, actually I did. She said, I want everybody to think about love when they walk in the store. So um, some schools actually even write the formula on the instep of the front stairs. So as you walk up, you're looking at the formula. The other thing that this school did was um, every student that came back from summer break, they had, they got a sheet and it said, I chose love over the summer by, they wrote it in and they drew a picture. They papered the walls with this. And um, it was really incredible. So they had uh, evaluations that they had to do and feedback and all of this. So they had, I, I came in two weeks after school started and I addressed the educators, very similar to the keynote that I gave you. Um, but this was like five years ago, so it wasn't as well put together. But anyway, uh, so I addressed them and then, uh, they, you know, they were just launching it. And uh, so I'm walking down the hallway with the principal and one of the other teachers and they were like, we love this program. This program is so amazing. Um, the, the, the educators are saying they're happier. Uh, we have less behavioral referrals and you know all these things. And I said, that's really great, but you haven't even downloaded the program yet. <laughs> you haven't even started the program. It was, it was setting the intention to choose love. 
It was having all the students talk about love. It was, they had it up on their walls everywhere. The teachers had all decorated their doors with different choose love themes and they had had a competition. So it was like everybody was thinking about it and they knew they were going to do it. Wow, how powerful was that? It was really amazing. Um, some schools um, use morning meetings or check-ins um, to discuss all of this and and it's you can utilize it in every single area of the school here are some just quickly going over best practices um so we want everybody to be doing this we want this to be seen as a uh, choose love culture i mean when you talk about it um when when we ask about it, we're like oh are you choosing love um yeah we're choosing love at woodbury elementary school right so it is an action and uh, it becomes the culture so but but you have to start slowly there's no pressure there's no pressure with love right um what we suggest if you're going to a school and you're interested in this is um, you already know probably off the top of your head who are the other people that are like-minded and that would be interested in this. Get together a team, look at it, talk about it, talk about how you would promote it to get other people on board. You already know the people that are gonna resist this, right? So um, don't worry about the resistors, um, just start slowly. I mean, this has been started in districts with one classroom because one teacher uh, resonated with it and started in one classroom. And what happens is that those kids love it so much. They start talking about it. The other kids start talking about it. Then the other educators go, what are you doing? What do you, I mean, what are you, what's choose love? And then other educators get on board. And I've seen it go from one classroom to an entire district to other districts in the area. It's a movement. Um, Inspire all the staff to learn about and incorporate the message of Choose Love. The front office, the lunch ladies, everybody's on board. Everybody talks. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a language. It's very simple. Um, and it's all about the formula. But everybody understands it. Everybody talks in it. Um, it helps with connection. Encourage parent participation through the Choose Love at Home program. So there's programming for parents as well that corresponds with what you're teaching the kids. And actually in COVID, our masterclass really took off. And this is the first thing that I did. And it's, a, it's pretty intense. Um, but what parents did was they got together virtually with a glass of wine and they would watch like a 15 minute video um, and then they would discuss it and then they would practice it for a week and then they would come back they would talk about um, you know what their experience was they'd watch another video discuss that spend another week um, that was something fun that parents did and then we also have a community program because really we need a consistent message. And when I was launching this across the country, um, if they had a celebration, I would have the chief of police, I have the mayor, I'd have the chamber of commerce, the downtown business district association, all of these people saying, wow, how can we choose love? How can we support this initiative within our schools and families? And so we created the choose love community program um, so that they can. So I kind of want to uh, open it up to questions and, and sharing now, if you would like to, if you have any questions. So if anyone has questions, please unmute yourself and feel free to pose your question now or put it in the chat. Comments? Well, I have a comment, Scarlett. That this material is, is absolutely wonderful. Um, the fact that it can spread from even classroom to classroom within a school, it can spread from the school to the community. It's something that can be adapted for different age groups. Um, it's not that it's a formula per se, but it's a simple way to remember the sort of the four pillars and then to build on them, but it has curriculum to it. So it, it means that you can teach it. Um, and this is the best of social and emotional learning is there are two components to it, right? The curriculum you teach and then how you put it into action 
on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, how do teachers utilize these strategies in their interactions with children? It's not just, well, I'm gonna teach you forgiveness today, kids, but when you misbehave, I'm not forgiving you. You know, it's how does the teacher practice that forgiveness too? So those two pieces to it um, make it such a powerful uh, program and movement. We also have extension programs. So everywhere that I saw uh, a, a gap, I worked with um, professionals and developed programming that fills that gap. Now, pre before COVID, we kind of had it on a different page because we didn't want to overwhelm. Um, but when we redid all of our programming during COVID, um, we added these implements directly in the lessons. They're on the right-hand side and they're all related to trauma. So there's a program on grief. Um, we, add, uh, we add tapping. I don't know if you're familiar with emotional freedom technique. Um, it's used in the military. I used it following the tragedy and, and found immediate physical, mental, and emotional relief. It is so vitally powerful. It's scientifically proven to work and it's great with kids mm -hmm. because it is a tool that they can use to find relief from any kind of pain. And it's almost immediate. So we work with, we've partnered with the Tapping Solution. They wrote a program specifically for us. It is inside the, uh, the lessons, you have access to that as well. Um, we have, we work with a trauma expert, Katie Walker. She's fabulous, she's incredible. And uh, her programming is on there as well. Um, I, there's a mindfulness program. Uh, after the first year, the feedback was, we want more breath, more mindfulness, more movement. So we worked with an organization called Sensational Kids and Allison Morgan, you may know of her. She created a program specifically for Choose Love. Um, that is also on there. There's so much, I don't wanna overwhelm, but um, you know, you can, you, you have access to it and you can just go through it. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, I would start with choosing love in our brave new world. Um, those are between four and six lessons specifically designed for right now, for K through 12. Each year has its own individual lessons, but that's where I would start. That's where schools this year, most schools are starting with our brave new world. And then they're launching into choose love for schools. We have our original much loved, <laughs> much appreciated, a program called Choose Love Enrichment Program. That's the original, it says original on it. Um, but I would recommend that you start with Choose Love for schools that has been upgraded during COVID. We have, uh, there's a digital platform. We have corresponding Google slides. Um, we really tried to listen and work with educators and, and hear what they needed and wanted um, to make their lives easier as to support them. Um, not that, not that you ca it can be any easier uh, or can be any harder, you know what I'm trying to say. Um, so we, um, we created that and I just encourage, I mean, everything is no cost. So you can go on the website, you can register and you can take a look at what we have to offer. And we have a team here that's here to support and love you. Starting in January, we are going to restart our nationwide calls with Choose Love educators. So we'll have educators that have been using Choose Love for years uh, on, the, on the Zoom call most likely. And, uh, and anybody is willing to join and ask questions about implementation, talk about problems they're having, um, share and compare uh, you know, different activities that they're doing. And just, it's gonna be a place for community and coming together. Well, thank you so very much, Scarlett, for this wonderful workshop. I see some kudos in the chats as well. Um, thank you all for attending. Before you go, we would like to ask you to click on the link that if it's not in the chat yet, it will be there soon. And that is the program evaluation. I would also like to share with you all about upcoming programs that continue the Growing Resilience series in um, the new year. CCE Delaware will be hosting a monthly series of webinars that are free to attend, although registration is required. 
Topics range from self-care to resilience in the time of global crisis. Everyone who attended this conference will receive details with the link to register via email. Lastly, we would like to invite you to connect with the Cornell Cooperative Extension if you are interested in joining a learning collaborative. Information about that and who to connect with will also be shared in the email in coming days. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you so very much, Scarlett, for your, your inspiration, for your message, um, for all that you've done for the world with this program. And I'm wishing all of you a wonderful holiday season, of course, uh, COVID style. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much.